Hi everyone, this is the first of our author interviews for June and the start of a series which will be going till the end of the year. Um, and our first author, we're welcoming CM Rosens, the author of The Crows and 13th and some other short pieces such as uh, The Folklore of Pagamon Sea, which is the, from the same world as the two novels and uh, Overexposure, which again, from the same world. Um, and gives you a bit more insight into one of the characters that you might be meeting today. So the way this author interview is going to go, we're going to be introduced to a little bit of CM Rosen's work. Um, she's going to share with us by reading a small section of her latest novel, and then we'll get into a bit of question and answer, finding out more about her work, her process, and her love of gothic horror and weird literature. So over to you, uh, CM Rosen's, for your reading please. Okay so I'm going to read a little bit from the, the end <laughs> um, which is the part where they're trapped in a Lovecraftian landscape where I did a bit of a loving parody of Dagon <laughs> if anyone's read that which is Lovecraft's short story. Um, so this is where three of the characters are stuck and trying to get away from an entity that you'll meet um, and it's from Ricky Porter's point of view. He couldn't tell distances in this place. How close was the doorway? Was it a doorway or a, a what? How far away was that thing and how fast could it move? Wesley didn't stir. Catherine grabbed him. She was pale, frozen. You're stronger. He's the one you jumped in to get, Ricky snapped, the cold prey feeling giving way to the other thing, the more familiar sensation of burning. Get him then. She hesitated, so he left her there to make her mind up. Back off slowly, no sudden moves. Predators smell fear, prey stink of it. Sours the meat, better they don't notice until it's too late. He kept up a measured pace, and by the time Catherine had sorted her head out and taken hold of her fuckwit brother, he was much further across the sands than he'd expected to be. Space is different, like the way Dad does it. Bloody hell fire, so he could be halfway through to the doorway, halfway out or halfway to his doom, or be nowhere near it at the same time. The anthracite powder shifted under his feet. Was it coal? He wished he was in the coal cellar of the crows, soaking in her oppressed, carbonised anger gangrene sweet, the darkness in her soul always keeping a welcome for him, no matter what else she thought or argued. A few more steps, a quick check over his shoulder. The doorway was closer. Catherine was dragging Wes and trying to close the gap between them, but the distance seemed to fluctuate as he tried to judge it. He didn't stop. Better one of them get out, better it was him. Not better for them. He frowned. That was something the mistress would point out, dry and sarcastic. All right, he'd explain it to her later. She'd understand. You broke the curse. Ricky stopped dead. That wasn't his thought. Not hers either. He knew what she felt like in his head. He didn't think it was the throne. Of course, if this was a throne room, where were they? Whose dimension were they in? Who spoke to him at night, whispered things, promised things? All right, Grandad, he whispered, wondering where the old bastard was. He watched the throne coming towards them, scuttling a few feet and then staying still, stalks waving, limbs tense. Its composite nature was clearer now that it was closer. That any way to treat your grandkids? They outlived their usefulness, so they have a new purpose now. But you, one and only, you have proved yourself. That sliced deep. Ricky closed his eyes, fighting the urge to change and rip the world apart. I ain't a fucking tool. You are the one and only, unique in your generation. That was not the denial he wanted. But I'm not a fucking tool. You're the biggest tool I've ever met, Catherine snapped over her shoulder, dragging Wes backwards over the desert towards him. Keep going, dickhead. The voice was gone. Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favourite bits. Um, it one is, of my and it's favorite. totally random out of context, but... <laughs> <laughs> I did it just for you. So if you want to know what any of that was about, you'll just have to read the book. Yes. Um, I think it's a really good example of how uh, you're blending this high octane weird terror, um, this 
horrendous image of an animate throne made up of composite body parts and people yeah um and this sort of uh unnatural reality bending world and then this the, the relationship between those three characters and the humor um and these kind of breaks of normality um it's one of my favorite things so humor is quite a key part of your work and there's also a lot of uh, horrifying body horror in there there's murder there's cannibalism there's eldritch beings there's all sorts of terrible terrible things what is it about you that works so well um, in that mix of horror and comedy or humor and the gothic um what i like to do is make people complicit in the horror because i find that incredibly challenging and horrifying to be a part of or as a as a spectator or as a reader or as a viewer and i really appreciate that as a technique so i like to play with what the site of horror is and to bring the audience or the reader into that site of horror um, and the best way that you can do that, I think, is if you make people laugh at it. Um, so that's that's just something that's a, a little twisted thing that I like to do. <laughs> but also, I think it works a lot better as, a, 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 you know, with, with all of the gore and the violence and all of the other stuff that I just um, I just enjoy. <laughs> um if there is humor as well because um i'm not trying to write splatterpunk or extreme horror in the way that um other authors do like aaron beauregard or um you know a few others uh, in the the modern scene um i'm just trying to I, I don't actually find cosmic horror very interesting to write if it's really high stakes and big action and um, what I find interesting is people. And what I find most interesting are character driven stories where the characters um, are forced to go through various things and react to stuff and then you see them on this journey. Um, and I find a lot of humor in. Um, characterization and in banter and that's the kind of that's the thing that I really like to do and I do respond personally to trauma with laughter and I like to laugh at things that <laughs> like retrospectively um and so that's it's been a very healing process for me as well I suppose by, by putting those things together um yeah so it's it's been it's been fun putting the books together in that way you mentioned about this idea of making your audience complicit and to some mm -hmm. extent the humor is uh, affecting that but um obviously ricky porter is <laughs> sort of the cannibal eldritch god chab next door um, and there's been sort of in readers, there's caught, there's been a mixed reaction to Ricky, but he's got his sort of fan club of people who've really fallen in love with him as a character. And I'm wondering if you expected that and how you feel about it. <laughs> and, and do you feel that people are feeling themselves to be pulled into complicity with his actions or is something different going on than you're expecting? Oh. <laughs> do this as a Ricky fan, obviously. <laughs> um. It's very gratifying that people like Ricky because Ricky uh, was the character I didn't expect to be writing in the Crows at all. Um, he just sort of appeared as a vehicle for some things that I thought, well, actually, maybe I want to start exploring. Sort of before I, I thought of the book as a product that I could sell, um, as a story that I wanted to write. Um, Ricky ended up being the character that I thought, oh, I could put a lot of traumatic things that I haven't really, you know, that I feel personally distanced from and, you know, sort of family stuff and kind of translate it into and make it extreme and then 
translate it and have fun with it and make it into this character and put it onto this lad. Um, and that was very cathartic for me to do. And so when I ended up uh, publishing the book <laughs> um, and then going, oh, OK, this is this is now my my trauma book. And this is now <laughs> like something people are going to read. Um, it was quite interesting to see people's reactions. And I enjoyed um, I enjoy it when people say, no, I don't relate to him. I think he's an arsehole. I'm like, yeah, he is an arsehole. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, that's completely fair. Um, and I'm very bemused by people who are like madly in love with him. <laughs> it's like one person in particular because he's also asexual and aromantic. Um, and it just, I'm like, oh, we wouldn't like that. <laughs> Leave the boy alone. Um, but um, yeah, it's quite gratifying actually to find that there's people do find him uh, so not necessarily sympathetic. I mean, I think uh, I think people do think he's sympathetic. I know someone. I, I know there are some people who don't think he's sympathetic or um, find it hard to sympathise with him because he is such an asshole. But also that he's he can be humanised, and that's that's an interesting. And I think it really just depends on your perspective on that character and, and the whether you can balance what he is and what he does. So I, I think that says more about the reader than it does about the character, like when when people have different views on him. So I find that very interesting, interests me. But yeah, I'm, grat I'm gratified that people enjoy him in some form. Yeah, um, I'm not the person that's madly in love with Rick. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I do find him I, I don't know, just a deeply interesting character. I, I think he is an asshole, 100%. Yeah. But he's in that sort of asshole, but I love him category of uh, fictional character. Mm. Um, and he's become a reference for a lot of things I see in other media. I'm like, that's oh, a bit of a Ricky, um, <laughs> which I know I keep saying to you as well, Mel. <laughs> like, um, just to kind of help people who've maybe not read your books yet, maybe we could do a, like a quick introduction to some of your key characters. So. Um, for those who haven't read um, the books, let's do that first. Let's say, right. can you give me an elevator pitch for the crows and an elevator pitch for 13th? <laughs> um, oh, I can't do elevator pitches <laughs> at all. Um, and I'm sure that I, I, I have not seen the questions beforehand for the interview, so I wasn't, <laughs> I'm very unprepared. Okay. Um, you can crows... it doesn't have to be an elevator pitch. Okay. <laughs> intro, let's say. Right. The Crows is uh, the last 33 days in the life of a working class woman who falls in love with a manor house and the manor house is in love with her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> basically um and um she doesn't know she's got 33 days left to live but her neighbor does and he also knows that if she dies at the right time he's going to get everything he wants namely her house so he has to try and keep her alive until until then which proves a lot harder than he thought <laughs> <laughs> so that would be ricky yes so that's the crows. That's essentially what the crows is. Um, 13th is um, three cousins um, who have to keep one another alive, basically. <laughs> There's a theme here. Um, Katie is the 13th child of a 13th child. And when she uh, turns 18, she's going to turn into an eldritch horror that feasts on its own kindred, hmm. basically. And the whole story is just about other people's reactions to that and keeping her alive or not. And, um, you know, investigating what she is and whether or not she can control it. So, yeah, that, I made it sound very boring, but. <laughs> 
two sort of main characters in that are Ricky pops up again and the other cousin Wes who we met in the the reading that you you gave didn't you and yeah and he's meant yes um Wes and Katie are brother and sister Wes is pushing 30 and same age as Ricky basically and um Katie is 17 in the book so there's a lot of them trying to remember that she's not a kid but also she's a minor so there's a lot of uh her pushing back against them and that sort of thing but it's definitely adult and not YA yes yes mm. yeah um and the voice in Ricky's head that we saw in that um section as well is uh one of the main characters from the first book but I won't tell you who for spoiler reasons mm. yes maybe bordering on spoilers right um so let's take a sort of four of those characters um just as an introduction for people so can you give me three words that's it that's all i'm allowing you for yeah. ricky carrie wes and katie okay um ricky is um complicated <laughs> um an autodidact is that one word can i have that as a word it's hyphenated yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> oh can i say chav because <laughs> that that basically i feel like you're missing out some of the key parts like god cannibal soothsayer <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what he does that's not what he is <laughs> oh sorry yes fair. <laughs> that's the way that if people are just listening to this without knowing the books they could presume this is a sort of a lovely family seaside drama <laughs> yeah no, no yeah complicated he's a complicated man he's a complicated man he's a complicated cannibal soothsayer <laughs> yes. okay um, carrie um oh i was gonna give like a massive spoiler then <laughs> oh no hang on um traumatized naturally yeah um oh it's hard i'm gonna go with uh oh she's not very i was gonna go with pragmatic but yeah i think yeah traumatized pragmatic um and i need a word that means like you know bad at decisions <laughs> Yes, oh, but what uh, <laughs> bad at decisions. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wes? Playboy. Mm. Um. Oh. <sighs> yeah, that's okay. Playboy, drug addled is, is definitely one of them. <laughs> and, um, it's not fair to say irresponsible, but he kind of is in this book, so. Mm -hmm. Always. I mean, Troubled also, is better. Troubled. Troubled is better. Yeah. Also quite eldritch. Um, Very, yes. Not for the reasons people would assume. Yes. Yes. Um, and Katie, our teenager. Oh, Katie. Um, Anti-heroine. Angry. <laughs> also traumatized is everybody traumatized is that just a catch-all everybody is that's just a catch-all <laughs> yeah um lonely i think katie's character is intensely lonely that's really sad mm. um i mean obviously part of the uh investigation is this kind of the interdynamics of them as characters but also this sort of incredibly complicated eldritch family situation that they are all in sort of i mean carrie's been sucked in hasn't she um yeah not really her choice she doesn't have eldritch parents um <laughs> <laughs> no i think her dad's a plumber or something like that isn't he so yeah well he comes and helps with the plumbing doesn't he i think he does yeah so he's quite good at that <laughs> um, yeah it's not helpful. so sort of how did you work on developing those relationships and um how did the idea come to you as well 
for all of these kind of uh, intricate components of this massive family? So um, oh, okay, so I really liked the, um, I love uh, the concept of uh, like the mother of a thousand young which is the Lovecraftian mythos kind of thing and so the idea sprung from that and I took it very literally as <laughs> what a family would that be like um, and what would happen if you had this um, this entity that just kept spawning and then like you ended up with this inbred um, family of you know incestuous eldritch abominations just wandering about and what would they do and what if they were human passing and you didn't always know what you were dealing with and then it just kind of um when i translated that into a kind of a, a seaside town or like a creepy coastal english uh you know it, it they ended up being this very middle class aspiring but maybe mainly because I thought that was quite funny, but also <laughs> um, just what would happen if, you know, why haven't they ended the world yet if there are a thousand or something of them? Um, and the reason would be because they actually quite like their lives and they quite like being top of the food chain and they quite enjoy, you know, um, having barn conversions and uh, joining the Rotary Club and the Women's Institute and arguing about flower rotors. And this, so it's, they're just so boring. They're just this mundane, boring family that actually eat people occasionally, as you do. And they eat each other, they literally eat each other. And that kind of became a vehicle for this very, um, the idea of very toxic family environments where, um you know you've got people who want to control everybody else and they do that in very particular ways and then you have um elements of psychological abuse and emotional abuse and manipulation and how that filters down through the generations except that these generations naturally don't die so you have older generations still continuing with this toxic cycle of behavior, perpetuating that through generations of family. Um, and they've got all their eldritch rituals and they've got all of that, but the, the, the ones that are keeping them from fulfilling their destiny, if you like, and sort of taking over the world and bringing in anything else from the other side and all of that kind of stuff is themselves. Um, and so I thought it would be really interesting because again, cosmic horror as a, you know, as a broad landscape doesn't interest me that much. Um, I love the concept of it, but I don't, I don't find that compelling. Um, what I like to do is look at individual, I'm not saying it's not compelling, just for me, but um, I like to look at individual relationships and go, well, what, how would you how would you live in that environment and, and what would be the family fail safe why you know said so why aren't there already like millions of them if they spawn all the time and so the 13th child of a 13th child is like that mechanism that um grows up and then kills everybody <laughs> um and so then i had to have reasons why you couldn't just kill the 13th child of a 13th child what you all that kind of thing um and then how would you respond to that as as its brother you know or its cousin and how would how would that childhood be like and what what how does that impact the way that katie thinks about herself and the way that katie thinks about her life and all of that kind of stuff and what does she actually want to do and you know so that was an investigation into all of that and it was just a lot of questions that I put together and explored and it turned into a book with nice. a plot. <laughs> I mean that brings us on to a common question that people are interested in is about your writing process it sounds like you do sort of quite a lot of exploratory writing and sort of chasing down ideas and following them through um, but sort of how do you go about putting together these books um 
so at the moment, because they're very character driven, what I'm doing is writing the arc separately. Um, I tend to write out key scenes that I think are going to be so, so like the midpoint catalyst or the, the climax or where would be a good place to start. And I'll give myself lots of options until I can sort of see the shape of the book that I want it to be. And then I will put it together almost like a jigsaw. So it's, um, and then it, um, it's, it's difficult to write these linearly. Um, the Crows was easy to write linearly because it was a straight run from day one to day 33. Mm -hmm. um, and I already knew that story really well because I'd had it kind of percolating in the back of my mind since about 2013. Um, so when I just kind of dusted off the first draft of it and completely rewrote it and that was an easy, much easier thing to do. And I just um, changed the ending in the beta stage rewrites. And, you know, I rewrote it a couple of times, but this is the version that I'm very happy with. Um, 13th, because I could tell the story of the character arcs in different ways, uh, was a little bit harder. So I had to have a lot of outside uh, critique for that to tell me what what was wrong with the pacing and, and that kind of thing and then I, I gutted it twice um, and then rewrote the middle um, twice um, and I think it it yeah I'm, I'm very happy with the way it is now um, so the way I think the third one's going to go is I'm going to do a ton of exploration writing and arc writing um, and put the characters in different situations and scenarios and reactive scenarios and see what happens um, and then fit that around the, the plot that I've got, if that makes any sense at all. So it's, it is for me, it's like a jigsaw. Yep. And then I'll rewrite the whole thing um, as a one coherent narrative. But until I know all the beats and things like that, there's no point in me trying to write linearly. Um, so I, I write very chaotically but it, yeah, it all comes together in the end. Everyone has their different process. I am in awe of anyone who's writing novels at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to thank you for speaking to us. And I'm going to ask you a couple of um, a sort of uh, standard questions that I'm going to be asking each of our interviewees. Um, which is just a little bit about your relationship with uh, Gothic and horror and your own reading. Um, and inspirations. So what was the book or the film or the text of whatever sort that got you into horror, the gothic and all of this sort of dark or supernatural fiction? Sin City. Oh really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was the first I I was um I hated it, it the film. Oh uh, I hated it. And it gave me nightmares and um I that was the thing that got me into to violent horror with that sort of um uh that that kind of grittiness I guess um and it was the first film I saw when I was at uni um and I don't know why it just it that was the thing that 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 really creeped me out was the yellow man and oh my god like I just hate it so I can't tell you how much I hate that viscerally so so much um and what I do when I don't like something is I try I, I kind of am almost immerse myself in it so it's not frightening anymore it's like a cat that you sort of grab by the scruff and force its nose into something <laughs> like that's what I do to myself. Um, before that, um, I'm I've always I what I don't I don't really consider it like um, I don't know, it's just a part of my childhood growing up. So it's so far in the background, I don't even think about it, is um the Adams family. Mm the 60s show and the um, Angelica Houston, Raul Julia versions, those films, um, and um, Carry On Screaming. <laughs> <laughs> what an eclectic range. Yeah, 
um so those are the those are the sort of soft horror versions and hocus pocus as well which is my childhood halloween film um but those like with this sort of soft versions of things that i grew up with and i i'd never seen anything really scary ever until i went to uni and watched sin city with the film club as like my very as a little fresher um yeah and I was absolutely like, I couldn't sleep that night. It was like the most horrific thing I'd ever seen in my entire sheltered life. And um, and now I guess I write body horror <laughs> and people doing horrendous things to each other. And I quite enjoy that. So, yeah. There you it, go. <laughs> there, there you go. What... Um authors horror gothic or otherwise would you say have influenced you um both positive positively po possibly sorry positively or negatively like i will never do this um like you mentioned a little bit of a a sort of um a reference back to uh lovecraft but your writing is very very different and i'm wondering <laughs> if it's a, a homage or a i like book of a snoop you know yeah um Lovecraft makes me laugh mm. I don't think that's what it's supposed to do <laughs> um and I I like I like parodying Lovecraftian heroes so I've done that in my novella um The Reluctant Husband that's going to be coming out um hopefully the end of this year in the Spooky by Association anthology so that's where you get to meet Nathan Porter who's this human occultist um, who is very much kind of the Lovecraftian hero in um, Shadow Over Innsmouth. So I've deliberately kind of adopted that sort of, um, that sort of faux turn of the 20th century, early sort of, you know, 1920s kind of, uh, or earlier kind of tone. Um, and I just, I just enjoy. If thirteenth is thirteenth um, is basically Dagon at the end. It's this lovely landscape of volcanic rock, um, and I do have, you know, sort of creatures coming out, massive creatures coming out of like the sea, and like you know, rotten fish everywhere. That's that's in Dagon, and and the whole kind of monochromatic moon, black rock landscape. Um, and I do something slightly different with it than I think Lovecraft <laughs> intended. Nobody runs off and goes mad. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, it's sort of just a constant low level annoyance, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're more annoyed at each other than they are about what's going on in the, yeah. Um, and I think that, so, so yeah, so, so Lovecraft, um, I've always been interested in Lovecraft's concepts. I think he's a main one. Uh, Ramsey Campbell is one of my favorite authors in working in that kind of genre. And if you don't, if no one knows who Ramsey Campbell is, um, he's written, um, if you want some good short stories, Visions from, Br from Brichester um, is a fun companion one and, um, the Inhabitant of the Lake and Other Stories, um, which is the one that got me into Ramsey Campbell. Um, like lots of lovely little bite-sized eldritch horrors in the Seven Valley. Um, and that was like where I realized, you know, oh, that's really cool. You can, you don't have to be in like, you know, a, an American context for this to work. And there are actually lots of places in England I can think of and Wales that this would work really well in as a concept. And then I sort of look, yeah. Um, Ray Bradbury is another one I really like. Um, and From the Dust Beyond is quite a nice one that's got a house and a, a spooky family, uh, which is in itself quite influenced by the Adams family and sort of the Charles Adams um, cartoons. Um, Crimson Peak, obvious reasons. Guillermo, anything Guillermo del Toro does as an aesthetic, I love that. Um, and I like, um, I've been into a lot of his films for, for years, things like Kronos and The Devil's Backbone and that sort of gothic atmosphere, um, but also centering very human people 
and generally from a child's perspective, I find that really compelling and interesting. Um, I mean, we'll yeah. pop out in the universe there, Mel, if anybody's wanting to adapt these films, just pass on, pass on these books to Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> great uh, <laughs> um yeah so yeah those those are the those are the main the main positive influences i think but i i read i mean i i, I uh i don't do you remember the foresight saga yeah when that was on telly because i haven't read it mm -hmm. but i did um we used to watch that um, and the Midsummer Murders, uh, see when that first came out, and the Foresight Saga was where I got really into family drama and how compelling that can be, just as its own thing. And while I don't write, I write. So these books are set in contemporary um, England, so it's modern day. Um, but I don't really find straight contemporary fiction that interesting to me to read unless it's very focused on people and those sorts of interaction like you know what I mean like that's um it has to be I I look for very specific things in my my reading I think and so family related stuff and family trauma and all of that kind of stuff generational trauma I find that really compelling and interesting and um cathartic i guess to read um but midsummer murders is also that other aspect of like the ramsey campbell kind of thing which is what would happen if it you know the seven valley but make it eldritch and midsummer murders is like incredibly gothic rural gothic um with incest and murder and secrets and lies and people keeping their brothers embalmed in a room um obsessing over them with candles and I'm like these reveals man <laughs> and I, I watched that as a 10 11 year old and I had no idea how deeply um you know the the first couple of seasons of Midsummer Murders had impacted my writing until I rewatched them recently and went oh <laughs> oh that's why I, <laughs> that's why I have this image in my head wow okay I keep finding that with uh, all the stuff I watch, uh, you know, I, I'm a big 80s sword and sorcery fan, obviously, and well, not obviously to people who don't know me, but I am. Um, and I watch back and I'm like, oh, that explains a lot. <laughs> um, my last question is so that people sort of get an idea of your tastes as well, and also your chance to influence the world. Um, if you could give five recommendations, not of books this time, but of uh, audiovisual text, so films or TV series within uh, perhaps the realm of horror and gothic, but if you want to go outside of that as well, perfectly willing to accept those recommendations, give me five recommendations. Right, Midsummer Murders, Obviously. for your rural gothic killing sprees of joy. Um, I feel like I've, I've given a few because I would I put Crimson Peak up there. But if you want an alternative, um, Kronos, the Guillermo del Toro, um, is a really interesting take on vampires. Um, and I found that one. I, I do like that one. It's my little I've got a soft spot for that one. So I'll recommend that one. Um, three more, right? Um, OK. Um, oh, this is hard, Sam. I know. I this know. is really hard. Um, okay. I'm just thinking of like all of the things that I've currently watched. I hate myself, but I'm going to say Castlevania as that was my anime choice. Why not? Um, I, I'm, I, well, because, yeah. It's just, it's just that wonderful thing of, of Japanese video games trying to do Europe, like medieval Europe. <laughs> like, oh, why? But also it's a really good show and it has Richard Armitage. Yeah, <laughs> it's like my favorite. Um, I'm gonna go, so how many is that? That's three still. Three, so two, okay. So I've got to go Hammer Horror because that's like, Hammer was my, Hammer are my comfort films. 
um, and I would recommend all of them <laughs> from the classic uh, 50s and 60s range. <laughs> but I have to pick one. <laughs> I have to pick one. Oh, they're also problematic now as well because you've got things like, oh God, yeah. Um, but okay, I'll go with. Does the whole Dracula franchise of Christopher Lee count as one? Because it basically is just one film. <laughs> I mean, I think that's pushing it, but I will accept. Uh, All right. All Dracula suit is including Dracula. Is it 1972? Yes. Um, and this, well, well, that he does play Dracula in that, but there's this weird like backstory that doesn't fit any of the other films. So it's unclear whether that's like a separate. Okay, well, we can maybe not that one, the rest know. of them, but not that well, one. Well, the satanic rites of Dracula, where he's a businessman, just surrounded by everything that can kill him, in the same way that he is in his castle. So, um, all right. Um, one last one. Oh, okay. I'm trying to think of another hammer that is like an actual, but they're all too good or too awful, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like um, you can come out of hot hammer if you like as well. Can I? <laughs> it's nothing but hammer now. Um, oh, do you know what? I'm gonna go uh, Woman in Black with Ooh. Dan Radcliffe. Oh, oh. <laughs> because that's the first ghost story that Hammer ever did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I was really excited. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, and I do like it as a film. And I, it's not one of the best ones, but I've got a soft spot for it, just as a, yeah. It was very creepy um, to me because I saw it for the first time in Russia, in Russian. So all of those kind of half heard half understood moments were extra half heard and half understood. So there's this kind of on the edge of consciousness, lack of understanding going on. Um, I'm going to change that from the film to the play, in fact. Ooh, then. Very fancy. That, that play, I mean, I, the, the reason I love the film is because I really enjoyed the play and I've seen the play a few times. And it is like when you're just sat there and then she's just actually there. Mm -hmm. And if you're sat on the eye, like, oh my God, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's a different experience. I can imagine. So I mean, I'm, I'm going to go with The Woman in Black, the play as my last one. Okay, I accept. And, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, CM Reasons, to chat about your books. Um, if people are wanting to know more or find out more, you can look in the links below. Um, if you go to uh, CM Reasons Kofi, you can find not only links where you can buy her books, but also um, information about uh, other things that she's doing. Is your podcast information on your Kofi page as well? Uh, it's on my website, which is cmrosens.com. There we go. So if you're wanting um, a podcast with uh, an audio recording of The Crows at the moment, and also extra material from Pagamon C. Um, then recommend and if you're looking for extra reading on Pagamon Sea World if you get sucked in there's even more on the Kofi um, for people who subscribe and support so thank you very much Mel for joining us and mm -hmm. goodbye